Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Alyssa Ayers, and I'm Dean of the Elliott School of International Affairs. It is my pleasure to welcome you all to another event in the Rebooting Trade Series, hosted by the Institute for International Economic Policy. This series explores the challenges facing globalization and the multilateral trade system and brings renowned experts to the Elliott School to share their insights on such matters as women's economic empowerment, climate change, pandemic-driven supply chain disruptions, new technologies, and the future of multilateral institutions. Today, we are delighted to hear from a former congressman and former chief appellate judge at the World Trade Organization, James Backus. James Backus is Distinguished University Professor of Global Affairs and Director of the Center for Global Economic and Environmental Opportunity of the University of Central Florida. He has spent his life in public service. He was a founding judge and was twice chairman, the chief judge of the appellate body of the WTO. He served in the US House of Representatives elected from Florida and has been a US trade negotiator. He serves on the United States Leadership Council of the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network. He served on the high-level advisory panel to the Conference of Parties of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. He has chaired the Global Council on Governance for Sustainability of the World Economic Forum and has chaired the Commission on Trade and Investment Policy of the International Chamber of Commerce. So who better to talk with us today about the future of global trade? We are very excited to have someone with his expertise join us today. Our own vice dean, Professor James Foster, has known him personally through their shared connection to Vanderbilt University. And I know vice dean Foster has wanted to host Professor Backus here at the Elliott School for some time, so we're thrilled that he was able to join us today. Now, in addition to his extensive public service, Professor Backus is the author of numerous books, including Trade and Freedom, published in 2004, The Willing World, Shaping and Sharing Sustainable Global Prosperity, published in 2018, and named one of the best books of the year by the Financial Times of London, and with co-author Inu Manak, The Development Dimension, Special and Differential Treatment in Trade, published last year. So today we will hear from him about his most recent book titled Trade Links, New Rules for a New World. Professor Backus, we look forward to your remarks and to hearing more about your new book and to what you have to say about the world of trade ahead of us. May I invite you to take the podium. Without the pardon me, sometimes the mask is caught in the hearing aid. <laughs> now I am a complete once again. Uh, thank you, Dean, so much. Uh, and I thank my friend James and my longtime friend, Dick Charnovitz and uh, Jeff Shambaugh uh, and others for inviting me here uh, at Stein uh, University. Uh, which I've visited uh, a number of times in the past, but uh, not lately. So I'm happy to be back. This is my first venture out of my home think tank in Orlando uh, since uh, two years ago this week when uh, I had been speaking at a UN conference on trade and health and got the second to last plane out of Bali. The 24th of February was um, my mother's 95th uh, birthday. Um, she edited my new book, so she got the first copy. I autographed it for her, and she pointed out to me that I had, uh, in one place, written the wrong word. Uh, I'm looking forward to her editing my next several books uh, as, as well. Um, my mother gave me a great deal of momentum in life when I was young and uh, she told me, always aim high if you want to be of service to people and to the world. Uh, you can uh, never achieve any higher than you aim, so aim high. I've thought about that a lot lately, given current events. It was also on 
my mother's birthday, February 24th, uh, that uh, Vladimir Putin's uh, forces uh, invaded Ukraine uh, with uh, results that uh, are already reverberating worldwide and very will very likely uh, continue to do so, not only through the uh, tragic bloodshed in Ukraine, uh, but also in all the geopolitical, economic, and other uh, ramifications of this conflict. Some are saying that this is uh, a turning point in the world. Um, say that 2022 uh, is like uh, 1789 or 1989, or maybe even 2020 when this endless pandemic arrived. I don't know, uh, but um, I, I know that um, this conflict is causing a lot of us to question uh, much of the way things are and to ask ourselves and each other a lot of questions. Uh, um, is this the end of economic globalization? Um, is um, this the end of the liberal international order? Is this uh, the end of multilateralism in world trade? Or could this be a beginning uh, of a new renewal of all of these uh, in, a, in a way that works for a better and more sustainable world? I ask that last question because I am ever the optimist. Uh, I believe with Karl Popper that uh, we have a duty of optimism. Uh, so in addition to aiming high, I believe we uh, must be optimistic in doing so, so that our reach will approach our aim. Uh, thus, I've written an optimistic book, one that is uh, unfortunately much more relevant than it was uh, before February 24th. In this book, I, I ask what we should do to change the rules uh, we've uh, established and agreed in world trade because of all that has changed in the world especially in the past several years. Even before February 24th, the world had long been turning inward. Countries had been turning away from international cooperation. They had been turning away from trade liberalization. They had been turning inward uh, in different ways around the world and in many of those ways. Uh, uh, through some potentially dangerous uh, streams of resurgence of nationalism, nationalism that um, already caused two world wars and is always a threat when it goes to extremes. And now we have uh, Russia's uh, violation of international law. Uh, it's violation of Article 2.4 of the uh, United Nations Charter, uh, which prohibits <coughs> members of the United Nations from engaging in military aggression and the use of force against other members uh, of the United Nations. What Russia has done is a clear violation and I have joined with others in uh, supporting uh, very tough trade sanctions uh, against uh, Russia. I support what Canada, the European Union, the United States uh, and other countries have done in uh, imposing trade sanctions on uh, the Russian Federation by uh, removing the most favored nation status, the normal trade status for treatment uh, of Russian goods 
and services. I people said we should go farther and expel the Russian Federation from the WTO. There's no place for uh, a military aggressor uh, in an organization that is committed to the peaceful settlement of international disputes. But amid all this, I think we need to think anew about um, many other aspects of the world economy and of the natural world in which the economy exists. What Russia has done is distracted us from these issues. Foremost is climate change, uh, but there's also biodiversity loss. Uh, there are many other dimensions of our ecosystem that are at grave risk. There is, of course, the pandemic itself, and uh, the pandemic is not unrelated to these other problems. So when you destroy forests, so when you destroy animal habitat, bring us closer to these edges of the wild in ways we have never been before, it vastly increases the chances of uh, zoonotic diseases such as COVID-19. We must make that connection and we must make it in the trading system as well as in uh, our various efforts uh, to protect uh, and improve global public health. I am not under any illusion that the world is going to come together tomorrow and um, embrace all the uh, reforms that I have posed in my new book, uh, Trade Links. But remember that I'm someone who aims high. Uh, so I have set out in this book where I think we should be going in the trading system and how I think we can get there. Um, I think it's obvious from my resume that I'm a supporter of multilateralism and trade, and I'm a supporter of lowering barriers to trade, and above all, I'm a supporter of the international rule of law in trade and in all else. But as it is, uh, the multilateral trading system that we have been building for nearly 80 years is at risk of uh, decline, demise, perhaps at best, um, uh, continued push over to the periphery of uh, global governance, such as it is. And I think this has to be changed because we need uh, a rule-based world trading system if we hope to have sustainable uh, and shared prosperity in the world. And I think the only way for the WTO to move back to the uh, center of world trade where it belongs is through reform. I think the basic rules of trade that were established in the gap after the Second World War are so relevant and still fit for purpose. Basic rules of uh, non-discrimination, uh, clean among traded products, both uh, the national treatment rule and the uh, rule of most favored nation treatment are the core of the system, and I think they need to remain so. There are many other rules in the GATT and the other covered agreements of the WTO treaty that I think continue to be fit for purpose. But we have failed almost entirely since the establishment of the WTO in 1995 to improve the existing rules and write new rules where they are needed. Somehow we must come together and do this. 
there are many dimensions to this challenge. First is the trade inheritance that we have from uh, the ongoing and failed agenda of the Doha development round. We need to eliminate the remaining barriers to uh, trade and manufacturing goods. We need to eliminate the remaining barriers to trade and services. And we need to eliminate agricultural, agricultural subsidies and other distortions in agricultural trade that deny to many developing countries their rightful comparative advantage in the global market. There is a potential global bargain on these issues that has been there for as long as I've been engaged in uh, the trading system, which dates back now to 1979, when I was uh, a young uh, aide at USTR and when I knew everything. Um, the bargain is basically this. Uh, developed countries such as the United States and the European Union eliminate their agricultural subsidies uh, and exchange uh, for uh, them doing this and Japan and China and some others doing the same. Uh, developing countries of the world uh, agree that they will eliminate their barriers to uh, the exports of the developed countries in manufactured goods and services. If this happens trillions of dollars would be added to the uh, global economy annually. And then there are the new commercial issues of the 21st century. And these are issues that uh, are only partly uh, included in the current WTO treaty or are not included at all. Uh, the, the list is daunting, uh, intellectual property rights, foreign direct investment, competition, policy, greater improvements in, uh, on uh, harmonization uh, or mutual recognition, and standards and technical regulations, uh, and not least, far from least, digital trade. The WTO is largely without rules on any of these issues. There are efforts underway on some of them to uh, improve the rules we have, but these negotiations plot on and don't ever seem uh, to reach a resolution. The WTO cannot be relevant to the 21st century global economy if the WTO is still stuck in 1995. Then, of course, I would say at the top of our current list should be trade and health. Um, amazingly, the average tariff on uh, in the world on hand soap is 17%. Now, in the midst of a pandemic, when we we're supposed to be washing our hands a dozen times a day or more, why would anyone put a tariff, an increased price, on hand soap. And this is true of uh, many pharmaceuticals, uh, many other medical goods of all kinds. Uh, we have trade restrictions in the form of tariffs. We have export restrictions, uh, uh, restraints on uh, many of uh, the medical goods that are needed worldwide. We have regulatory barriers, uh, differing standards. When millions of people are dying in the world, why would we maintain barriers to trade in uh, medical goods? And I would add medical services. In the book, I propose a, a medical trade agreement that would eliminate all tariffs, uh, ban export restrictions put in motion greater efforts to harmonize how we deal uh, with pharmaceuticals and other medical goods. I am shocked that 
the members of the WTO have not already done this two years into this pandemic that still continues. I worry about my friends in China right now where the pandemic is growing. And I worry about all those elsewhere in the world who have still not gotten vaccines. I worry about my 95 year old mother. And then there is, in my view, the greatest of all the changes we must make in the trading system. We must commit the trading system to sustainable development, to using trade affirmatively to advance the achievement of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. This is actually not a revolutionary proposal. Uh, back in uh, the Congress, I was uh, one of the original co-sponsors of the implementing legislation for the Uruguay Round Trade Agreements. And if you look at the first page of the um, WTO Treaty, the preface in the first paragraph, you will read that uh, those who established the WTO agreed that trade and economic endeavor should be conducted in a way that uh, was consistent with the principle of sustainable development, with the objective of sustainable development. That to me should be at the center of what the WTO does going forward. Uh, I have proposed that um, the members of the WTO approve a climate waiver uh, that would allow measures taken by nations for legitimate climate reasons, but also for economic mo motivations to uh, be deemed consistent with WTO rules. I proposed that we condition trade in forest products on sustainable use of those products. I propose that we condition trade in mining and minerals products also on the condition that those um, economic endeavors be conducted sustainably. I propose that we address at long last the issue of wildlife trade, in part to protect the animals themselves, who don't deserve what we do to them every day, but also in part to protect ourselves from uh, the consequences of our degradation uh, of the world's land resources. <clears throat> there is much more we should be doing Many specifics are set out in the book, but I'll conclude now with just one overarching observation. We tend to think of the economy and the environment as separate concerns. This is the point Steve Charnovitz made in an article he wrote in the 1980s. So I'm simply echoing Steve now. These are not separate concerns. The principal insight of the Sustainable Development Goals in which I've worked and which I'm working for now is that our economic, environmental, and social concerns are all linked and they all have links to trade as I explore in the book, but anything that happens economically happens within an environmental context. Not only are the economy and the environment not separate, the economy is contained within the environment, within the natural world. And yet so much of what we do in the economy simply ignores that reality. And because of that, we are now about to reap the whirlwind. 
I'm sure you've all read the latest projections on climate change. I'm sure you're all aware of what's happening in biodiversity loss, problems we're having with our land resources and our water resources, uh, both uh, by land and in, in the oceans that comprise most of our planet. None of this is on the agenda of a WTF. All of it must be. This is a lot, and I've left out a lot uh, of my 400 page book in, in this uh, brief summary. Uh, but again, I think if we're going to do what we truly need to do, then we need to take my mother's advice. We need to aim high. Thank you so much for listening and thanks to all who are uh, listening uh, virtually as well. I look forward to any questions you may have. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. I'm Jay Shamba, Director of the Institute for International Economic Policy. And so we're going to take questions now. I'm just going to start very briefly with one before turning it over to, to all of you. Um, you mentioned earlier that you uh, find yourself as the climate person when you're most trade folks and the trade person when you're most climate folks. And so I wanted to, yeah, and so I wanted to um, maybe push you for just a little more specifics on this idea then of how would a country or when would a country utilize this waiver what are there are there steps you envision where you think a country could productively you you know use this waiver to try to advance climate goals and, and how you envision that i happen to have written down this answer <laughs> because oh, i want to make sure i get it right sure just to make sure I have a whole chapter I, in, in the book on this, but uh, the heart of the matter is this. We won't be able to do what we need to do with climate change if we insist that every national measure that's taken to address climate change, fight it, try to slow it down, stop it, uh, it is pure uh, within. Uh, environmental terms. Uh, rightly or wrongly, businesses, workers everywhere in the world are concerned about carbon leakage. And so are environmentalists. Um, if you oppose a, a, a limit on carbon emissions here, uh, what's to stop uh, those emissions from going offshore? so that you end up with uh, a, a reduced competitiveness in the local economy and you end up also accomplishing nothing overall uh, in terms of reducing uh, carbon emissions that's a, that's a uh, the um the notion that um, the climate success will be utilized, I think it's a very real concern. Um, the notion that there will be carbon leakage, they will have competitiveness effect. If you look at the empirical evidence so far, it's really less of a concern. But in politics, uh, what's real is what people think is real. Uh, and um, I don't think we'll be able to pass the truly ambitious climate legislation we need in the world, um, unless we permit measures that are legitimate climate measures, but also have economic motivation. So the question then becomes your question, how do we define them? And uh, I think we start with three elements. Uh, the first is uh, the core of the content of 
what I would pose as a climate waiver um, will be a, a waiver from the application of certain defined uh, WTO rules uh, for national measures that uh, discriminate based on the, uh, the amount of uh, carbon and other greenhouse gases that are committed in the making of the product first. Uh, that uh, second, fit the definition of climate response measure um, under the uh, climate agreement. And third, uh, echoing the chapeau article 20 of the gap, for those who uh, know uh, the details of these things, so, um, do not discriminate in, in a manner that constitutes a means of our or unjustifiable discrimination or a disguised restriction on trade. So those are three elements. Uh, to me, that's a starting point for uh, a discussion. Um, there are certain problems with this proposal. Uh, as many will leap to remind me, I discussed some of them in the book. One of them is that we have no common agreed method for measuring uh, carbon and other greenhouse gas emissions. Um, the climate cop has been unable to agree on that. They made some progress, but we are very far from a consensus worldwide on that issue. Uh, second, um, and, and here I discuss this in much greater detail in the book, um, we have no definition by the climate cop uh, of a response measure. No effort has been made to delineate, to draw a line between measures taken uh, to address climate change that include trade restrictions and are legitimate, and measures taken that include trade restrictions that are not climate measures, but only um, perhaps uh, measures approved on the pretext of um, assisting in the effort against climate change. But this is a start. And um, I propose this because in looking at all the other uh, uh, alternatives, and there are other alternatives, I, uh, I see a real collision uh, between trade and climate change uh, uh, on the horizon. You could leave this issue to the WTO dispute settlement and have WTO jurists define legitimate climate measures on a case by case basis, but I don't think that's what we have in mind. And right now, we don't even have an appellate body uh, to uh, make that decision. We could simply amend WTO rules, uh, but that's a much more daunting proposition. Also, here at the outset, maybe we don't know exactly what we want to waive on a permanent basis and what we don't. So maybe the experience of, uh, uh, of having a waiver will uh, instruct us in uh, how to construct something permanent some years from now. Um, we can have a proliferation of uh, carbon border measures in the world. Uh, that's what's happening now with the Europeans uh, uh, carbon border adjustment measure with some of the ideas that have been suggested in the Congress in the United States, uh, Canada, Japan, other countries. Uh, will these measures pass muster under WTO rules or not? Who knows? So we're inviting, uh, again, a collision between the two regimes. What I would do is bring people together on a multilateral basis to try to reach some agreement. And if we can't reach a multilateral agreement, perhaps we can reach a plurilateral agreement that over time can become fully multilateral, something we've done many times. Um, yeah, uh, Steve. Uh, so thanks, Sorry. you. there's a mic on the Yeah, Professor uh, Steve Charn is at the law school. So thank you for that, those great remarks. And I, as you know, share your vision 
on an effective WTO. Uh, and no one has been a greater leader for that around the world than you. But I have a, a kind of comparative institutional question. Given how ineffective the WTO has been, and given that it's got a consensus rule, why would we want to load on these really important issues that you're talking about on the WTO? Uh, if we've got concerns about uh, carbon leakage, why not give it to the climate cost in the Paris Agreement, the UN framework on climate change? If we want freer trade in medicine, why not expect the World Health Organization to do that? If we've got a problem in global wildlife, why not task UNEP or uh, the CITES Convention to do that? Why would we want to add these issues onto the WTO? when the WTO has already been so in effect? Well, I would say that uh, despite everything I just said, in many ways the WTO has been effective. I know you agree with this, Steve. Um, almost all trade, almost all over the world, almost every day is consistent with WTO rules. Uh, this is not a headline, but this is the way world commerce works. What the WTO has failed to do is live up to its mandate. There are several reasons um, why I would differ somewhat from what you've recommended. I'm not opposed to any of it in principle. The question is, again, one of effectiveness. Um, if there's a health issue, then certainly in the context of a WTO dispute, um, WTO jurists can recognize uh, that health agreement, the tobacco framework agreement, for example, um, as relevant public international law. What the jurists in the WTO cannot do is enforce that agreement because it's not part of the covered uh, corpus of the WTO treaty. Uh, the same with the other examples you set. Uh, now, um, for reasons of expertise and competency, uh, I think in many instances the WTO should work in concert with some of these other uh, organizations and drawing the, the line. Um, as an example, uh, you recall I suggested it should be the COP that defines uh, a response measure. If the COP defines a response measure, then I'm certain it would be that, that definition will be respected. If it doesn't, then the WTO jurists are going to have uh, no other option but to decide for themselves whether the particular measure before them uh, is a climate response measure or not. Um, we have to go back to the beginning here. Uh, the WTO uh, treaty covers all measures that affect trade. So that's a vast jurisdiction. Uh, and uh, it's not just between countries, but it relates to measures within countries. That's already true. Uh, and uh, in the absence of any action from some of these other international organizations, uh, and then where there are disputes, Inevitably, they're going to go to the WTO. And unless the WTO members have already agreed on rules for how to deal with those circumstances, they're going to be dealt with on an ad hoc and case by case basis in WTO disputes. So, and I think that's less than ideal. Um, and of course, it's ideal when the WTO members uh, establish and draw these lines in the WTO treaty itself, they should be working side by side with these organizations uh, and, uh, and go from there. In some instances that, it, that has happened, uh, there's a very good working agreement between the WTO and uh, CITES related to endangered species forever, but uh, uh, CITES does not have jurisdiction over illegal wildlife trade. Uh, and that falls within the scope of the WTO treaty. So there are ways to work out 
hybrid types of approaches that, that I would support. Uh, but uh, because of the fundamental reason that these measures affect trade, uh, I think they are um, appropriate for WTO action. Thank you. Um, yeah, Maggie. Mr. Banner, thanks for a very insightful um, discussion. Um, my name is Maggie Chen. I'm a faculty here at the Agnes School. I have uh, two questions, if you don't mind. The first question is sort of the analogy between the hand soap tariff that you mentioned versus a solar panel, panel tariff. Should we also try to include, you know, for example, removing tariffs on solar panels to address, you know, the environmental concerns and, you know, and the fight of the climate change? Yes. Okay. <laughs> That's why I have two questions. <laughs> I, I, I've written several art articles on that, Maggie. I won't recite them for you here. They're online, but you know. Okay, I will look them up. Uh, my second question is the relationship between regional treatments and multilateral treatments, which is a longstanding question in policy and, and in research. But in the current context, what, what do you do what do you think? How do you think RCEP, you know, regional treatment like RCEP, will affect the incentives uh, for WTO reforms? Well, I think the analogy that we Americans would uh, recognize is um, that of the states of the United States as laboratories, uh, democracy places where experiments can be made at the state level uh, and through learning by doing decisions can be made about whether uh, those solutions at the state level uh, should become federal solutions. Um, the WTO treaty, let me hasten to say, is not a constitution for the world. Uh, it, it's a trade agreement. Uh, but I think the system as a whole, uh, on the auspices of the WTO, uh, can benefit from experiments uh, at the bilateral and regional level on some of these issues. So, for example, uh, on a bilateral basis, the uh, forest provisions in U.S. Peru uh, trade agreements. Digital trade, uh, there are provisions in a number of the regional agreements that <clears throat> can be the basis for multilateral uh, provisions once the political will is summoned to make that. So, and there are many, many other uh, examples as well. There's always the danger that uh, there will be a diversion of trade. Um, because of these multilateral, because of these regional agreements, um, with their proliferation, uh, the whole principle of uh, most favored nations treatment globally is uh, threatened. So when you think about what a bilateral free trade agreement is, it's an agreement. In favor of the other two parties to that agreement. This means you don't discriminate against anyone who's not. There's an exception uh, in the gap, as I'm sure you know, what it allows that in certain uh, defined circumstances. Uh, I'm very fortunate that I was able, after nearly a decade on the fellow body, to get out of Geneva alive without having to say what those circumstances are. <laughs> uh, but so we, one must be alert to those potential dangers from regional trade agreements from a global perspective. Uh, but uh, on balance, uh, I voted for everyone I had a chance to vote for. I supported all of them that have come before the United States Congress, and I support the regional efforts of CPTPP and USMCA and the RC. Uh, look what's happening in Africa. Because on, on balance, I think they can be laboratories for learning how to deal globally with what we must deal with, including especially aspects of sustainability. Thanks. Other questions? Yeah, uh, Mike. Uh, 
uh, Michael Bohr, professor here of economics. So it's unlikely that we'll have a common price on carbon worldwide. It's hard to imagine that all countries will be facing the same, and companies facing the same incentives, which means differential policies across countries, which almost just seems inevitable that there would be really serious commercial disputes among, uh, among companies that are claiming that another government is providing a subsidy. You could have a climate waiver, but inevitably, it seems to me, in my cynical experience with trade policy in the last 30 years, that people will use climate arguments for just crass commercial benefit. How, how, how can the system be set up to avoid that kind of, well, frankly, just protectionist impulse? Well, it already is. Uh, the, uh, the fact that there is a waiver does not mean that there would not be disputes. The disputes would be about whether a particular scope of the waiver. In 1996, I spent most of the summer in Geneva trying to figure out whether the European uh, banana restrictions uh, on trade were within the scope of the Lomé waiver, the Lomé Convention. This is the same legal issue. Now, first of all, you define in the waiver precisely what you're waiving, which obligations. Maybe you waive subsidies obligations, maybe you don't. I'm one of those people who's very skeptical uh, about subsidies for any reason, uh, including some of these environmental uh, subsidies. Uh, but maybe they're included in the scope of the waiver, maybe they're not. And then the debate would be about uh, whether the waiver applies, and if so, whether the terms of the waiver that what you've described, something that's simply a protectionist or candidless action would not be excused because uh, there, there will be no climate purpose in it. Uh, you would have to look at the measure itself to determine that because no facts were brought before uh, the tribunal. Uh, in all likelihood, Arbitrary, unjustifiable, be seen as a disguise restriction on trade, and just not be eligible. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm Whitney Delavoye. Sorry, there's a mic. I'm Whitney Delavoye, smart old importer. Um, following along on that last question, um, I think you talked about having the waiver so that. Um, because we don't have an effective dispute settlement body, you know, we can um, still get something done. But I'm just wondering whether well, the waiver assumes that we also have an effective dispute settlement body. I see. Okay. Uh, which we don't now because of the actions of the United States of America, first the Trump administration, and now the Biden administration. They're both guilty. Okay. Um, but even so, um, you know. Right in the chapeau today, in Article 20, you have the you know, same uh, caveats that you just described. Uh, disguise. The problem's down in the, in the, please forgive us all the lawyers, all the nine lawyers in the audience. The problem's in the provisional justification. Uh, and and that's, the, that's the essential problem in getting mixed measures that have both environmental and economic motives through uh, uh, the uh, requirements for uh, being eligible for the, one of the general, general exceptions under Article 20. Um, it, it's very, very hard to uh, uh, prove that something is eligible uh, for provisional justification under one of the such paragraphs if, in addition to whatever environmental motives it has, it also has economic motives. That's the heart of the problem. Uh, the chapeau deals solely with how a measure is applied, not with what kind of measure it is. I know you know this. I'm saying this for the benefit of everyone else. But I mean, you always have the, the caveat about provided it's not a discriminatory measure and so forth. I mean, just let's, let's put a real example on the table. I mean, you 
think of the by definition by definition all these measures are discriminatory they wouldn't get to article 20. the question is the kind of difference and extent yeah, of discrimination yeah and it's and the question is disguised discrimination right so it can you know, let's take which it could be uh, which can be the origin of a dispute which means that we're still making this you know case law case by case um, I mean, if you take the, the, the gasoline case, um, which is the first case ever at the WTO. Um, I remember I was there. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, EPA adopts a regulation on the formulation of gasoline. Um, Venezuela comes and says it's discriminatory against gasoline from Venezuela, um, as opposed to gasoline um, in the United States. Um, and so then you're going to have the, the whole discussion all over again. Um, and we're making case law case by case, and our beautiful waiver um, hasn't really accomplished that much. Oh, I don't know. Um, but in the absence of a waiver, we'll still have these things case by case, but there won't be any guidance for the jurists from the members themselves. Uh, furthermore, there won't be any guidance from the cop. Remember, I'm, uh, I'm trying to construct a waiver that uh, uh, will uh, have the input, not just of the members of the WTO, but of these same countries in their guise as members of uh, the climate agreement. And I would rather have a consensus if it can be obtained uh, uh, drawing these necessary lines uh, up front that could then be reviewed in dispute settlement, then have a situation in which the countries have not even tried to draw these lines, either in the COP or the WTO. And the disputes are left case by case. To, to I guess my follow up question then is um, you know, among the different disciplines, what are we going to waive? Um, I mean, is there going to be National treatment? Is it going to be MFN? Is it going to be only subsidies? What what do we imagine that uh, we're going to? Well, I, I, if you're talking about discrimination based on uh, uh, carbon content, then you, you're you're talking about a waiver of MFN and probably national treatment uh, as well. Uh, as I said to the gentleman earlier, I I, I think uh, you have to think well and hard about uh, subsidies issues in this context. There could be others. Uh, what I'm proposing is uh, uh, an initial thought of what a waiver might include. Uh, there's a long process for uh, constructing a waiver that would occur, include a working party uh, that would be appointed by the general counsel and over a period of months would uh, ask and try to answer all these questions and come up with a proposed waiver. But it would be a negotiated solution as opposed to uh, a judicial solution. Other questions? Yeah. Oh, by, by the way, I should add, it's a perfectly legitimate question. Yeah. I've asked those same questions myself. Uh, thanks very much. I, uh, my name is Eric Churchill. I'm, a, I'm an alum of the Elliott School, so glad to be back. I work at UPS um, here in Washington, DC. You mentioned at the top of your remarks about um, your support for expelling Russia from the WTO. And I wanted to ask if you could go a little bit deeper into that in terms of what that means for the institution you and, and international institutions in general. I think that there's been um, for a long time, uh, the idea of universality of some of these global institutions has been um, seen as one of their strengths. But if we're calling on expelling members, I'm wondering if that um, we're talking more about a club of like-minded countries, and if there's anyone else who, you know, under what conditions other countries might be expelled from other international institutions. Thank you. That, that too is a legitimate question, very legitimate one, and I've asked myself that question. And it may be that uh, Somehow this will spur rethinking along those lines, not only the WTO, but in some other institutions. Um, 
Now, if you look at the membership of the WTO as it is, um, you do not, shall we say, have full democracies uh, in every one of the 164 members. In fact, the latest global report I saw did not describe the United States of America as full democracy because of the changes made by Donald Trump who uh, tried to destroy representative democracy in this country the past four years. Um, we, we can't have a trading system that is comprised only of full democracies. That becomes uh, an even greater definitional challenge than the one that, that he and I were just discussing about where do you draw the line on a legitimate response measure. measure. And, but um, in, if you look at all these countries uh, and their various sins, um, uh, I don't think any one, any one of them right now is in violation of Article 2.4 of the United Nations Charter. They're not engaged in uh, unprovoked, aggressive use of military force against another country. So if you're asking where you would draw the line, I think that's where I would draw the line. Uh, you're asking whether I would support expelling other WTO members for other reasons. The answer is probably not, uh, because I'm mindful of the considerations uh, that you mentioned. I have been one of those people who's built the system uh, with that in mind, achieving universality. And I was very happy when Russia became part of the system in 2012, although if you look through Google, you'll see that I warned then that Mr. Putin would be a problem. <laughs> uh, and uh, he has been uh, in trade, and now it's more of a problem, but that's where I draw the line, sir. Uh, and in, in calling for the expulsion uh, uh, of Russia, I'm also aiming high. Um, I mean, what's happening is on a unilateral basis, individual countries are, are removing their MFN treatment from Russia that accomplishes the same purpose. He doesn't uh, magnify uh, the pain of the economic sanctions in a way multilateral action through the WTO would, but still uh, these actions I think are justified and, and I think they're permissible under Article 21. But again, I don't think they're in violation uh, of the WTO. I encourage more of them. Probably one more question. Um, yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, my name is Vincent Rodriguez. I'm a graduate student at the Elliott School. My question to you is, uh, what are your thoughts when you hear of a headline that says uh, that Saudi Arabia is uh, selling oil to the Chinese in Chinese Yuan, or for that matter, an OPEC country selling oil to uh, uh, the Chinese in Chinese Yuan? Um, should the U.S. be concerned? Should the international community be concerned? Or should we embrace, you know, the trade of oil and currencies other than, than the U.S. are? In, ter in terms of our overall trade relations uh, with China, uh, I would point out that China has not violated uh, the United Nations Charter, uh, use of force, I think China is violating the United Nations Declaration on Human Rights every day of the year. But how many other WTO members are doing the same? Uh, that's not where I would draw the line. Um, I think we should enforce human rights in other ways other than expelling countries from the trading system um, where domestic actions are taken. Uh, in general, China is in a difficult position right now. Uh, having joined at the hip with Putin, uh, I don't think their President Xi, much like what he's gotten, is posing real problems uh, for China. Uh, China would like the world to believe that China is a peaceful country, uh, interested only in peaceful rise. <clears throat> so the past several decades suggested. That is, in fact, the case. Um, 
I think we're rightly concerned about the course of President Xi has taken, which I think is a law enforcement challenge. It turns away from the liberal international order, it turns inward economically. And of course, it shrinks the part of the Chinese economy that's been most productive, the private sector. And it's a long term mistake uh, in terms of Chinese policy. Uh, but I, 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 I think the trade war that President Trump uh, conducted was uh, a huge waste, especially for the United States, but also for China. We suffered great losses. We, Trump accomplished little to nothing in what he set out to do in changing uh, the areas of Chinese uh, actions that most concern the United States and many of our trading partners. In terms of what's happening now, uh, uh, I support the efforts of, of the Biden administration to explain to the Chinese that uh, we won't appreciate it. They provide uh, military or other support for Russia in this situation is one for them. It's one thing for them to uh, refrain from uh, voting against Russia on the Security Council. It's quite another to assist the country uh, by providing them the uh, financing and sustenance they need to continue the military aggression. That would be a mistake by China. And uh, as someone who is a friend of the Chinese people, spent much time there, well, thank you very much for this uh, really informative talk and for your gracious time on question and answers. Um, I know that for those of you interested in the book, it is not yet for sale in the United States, but will be soon. And so I, I commend it to all of you, anyone interested, and um, I believe we'll be able to post a link on, on this at, at when this uh, event is posted online so people can find where they can find access to the book. If you, if you have a pen, <laughs> uh, uh, there is a code I'm free to give you where at checkout you get a 20% discount. <laughs> and the code is in, in caps B A C H U 2 2. B A C H U two two, and, and the book is available for pre order in, in uh, the United States. Uh, we published here in a few weeks. It's already been published in the uh, United Kingdom and Europe. Uh, I am one more victim of, of the supply chain. <laughs> it turns out that Cambridge makes the books in the UK and puts them on a boat. And in theory, ships them across the Atlantic Ocean to the United States. And they are not yet, but I'm sure they're on their way. Uh, also, my uh, previous book, The Willing World, uh, will be available immediately on paperback uh, online tomorrow. Thanks very much for your time. And thanks all of you and all of you watching. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.